Hi everyone, this is Jason Bierak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. We've had him on a number of times. It's Austrian School Economist, and he's he's an Austrian School Economist, and he's also the founder and president of Pento Portfolio Strategies. And last year, he put out a book, The Coming Bond Market Collapse, How to Survive the Demise of the U.S. Debt Market. Thank you for joining us again, Michael Pento. Thanks for having me, Jason. Now, um, Michael... Are you surprised that the uh, people in power, these Keynesian central planners, that they've been able to keep the game going longer than uh, most people have thought? Well, I, I guess you could say I'm a, little, I'm a bit surprised. Um, we have QE ending in October, but the meat and potatoes of QE is over at the end of July. It will go down to $25 billion per month. There will only be about $65 billion left in QE. I think that's kind of levitated asset prices, prevented that healthy deleveraging from occurring. It it has engendered a huge stock market bubble, another bubble in housing. Uh, people can't afford first-time houses anymore, for instance, and they they just they just don't have the credit scores to meet the uh, loan requirements. So you're not getting the first-time home buyers in housing, but you still see home prices up about 30% year over year in, in the uh, in the in the prior year. So we have the bubbles recreated. We have stock prices that have completely decoupled from any semblance of economic factors. That all ends, I believe, by October at the latest. We'll have a healthy deleveraging. We'll have another pullback in the market and in in other assets. Of course, the biggest bubble that exists of them all in all of economic history is the bubble in fixed income in bonds. And that bubble is not only evident here in the United States, it's also evident in Europe and mostly evident in Japan. I mean, Japan is paying 0.53% for 10-year note, uh, even though they have uh, an insolvent nation, 250% plus debt to GDP. They have inflation that's at a 30-year high, um, and yet someone is somebody, and it's really not somebody, it's the only buyer of, of JGBs is the Bank of Japan. And it's that's it's headed that way here in the United States and in Europe, where the only buyer of fixed income on the sovereign debt level is going to be central banks. And that creates that creates a huge problem in the future because that is the genesis of inflation. So you're gonna have a huge problem with inflation in the fifteen years fifteen in two thousand and sixteen. And eventually, they're going to have to stop buying these bonds, and that's going to cause a huge slingshot in interest rates. And I I think that's going to bring out a devastating deleveraging depression in the next few years. That's a good point about the global economy. And, you know, often a lot of these deflationists, they look at, you know, only the U.S. economy. They don't look at all the other different economies and how we're all connected. And the other thing about Japan is Japan is getting flooded with stagflation right now. Mm-hmm. Their food and energy uh, uh, import prices are going through the roof. Their manufacturers are being hit very hard. They're raising the VAT tax on their own citizens. And it just seems that, like, you know, they're, cri- they're trying to cripple their own economy. But I-, I guess this is the Keynesian endgame. You know, you have the negative interest rates that the Keynesian professors talk about. You know, people, uh, the, these evil hoarders, <laughs> they're not allowed to save. They're gonna, we're going to force them to spend. They have to consume. They have to take on debt. Um, what, what kind of tricks do the Keynesians have left here? Well, let's look at, uh, you mentioned Japan, and I mentioned earlier. So the entire plan on the part of uh, Kuroda, the central banker there in the Bank of Japan, and Shinzo Abe is to destroy the value of the yen to hopefully generate manufacturing and generate exports and provide a huge current account surplus. And and somehow engender prosperity in the nation of Japan. But look, look what's actually it has done. It is, is done nothing but destroy their balance of trade. They have a huge current account deficit. The value of the yen is down, uh, I think it's down 30% since 2011 versus major trading partners. They have a record amount of inflation over there going back over 30 years. Uh, in fact, their inflation rate is so high that the food prices are soaring well, well into the double digits. It's horrible news for a nation that has to import 80% of its food and energy uh, consumption needs. Uh, as I said, all this is occurring in, in, under the context of an insolvent condition, 252% debt to GDP, and, um, and a 10-year note that is trading at less uh, or just about a half 
of 1%. So they have no prosperity. They're killing their middle class. They've generated inflation. They've destroyed their currency. They've run up, they've run up quadrillions in debt. And there is no hope for that nation anymore other than a complete economic sovereign debt debacle. And I think it's going to occur sooner rather than later. Now, now, do you think the U.S. government is basically trapped itself in a – the Fed and the U.S. government have trapped itself in a corner similar to Japan, even though you know Bernanke and some of these other people at the Fed have said they don't want to ever be like Japan? But it seems a lot of the same policies have gone into effect that Japan has put into well, effect. Well, you have to remember, Jason, Japan really didn't do anything after their uh, debacle that started in 1989. They didn't really attack the monetary base strongly. They didn't have QE. What they've done is they've slowly gotten on board and taken a page from the Federal Reserve and started to expand the monetary base in Japan. Well, the United States didn't do any of that. We right away increased the monetary base or the Fed's balance sheet from $800 billion in December of 2007 to now $4.4 trillion. We've taken interest rates not a little bit lower. They were at five and a quarter in 2006. We've taken them to zero by the end of 2008, and that's where they remain to this day. So we have all this excess reserves, all these excess reserves in the banking system. We have 0% interest rates for now six years and running. We have all that inflationary tinder, which is ready to ignite. Um, and, I, and I strongly feel that after we get this brief correction in the stock market and in, and in the housing market, probably from the time of when we finish this interview to the end of October, we're going to have negative real interest rates for many, many years to come, just like we had back in the 2000s, which of course blew up the housing market. I, I predict another scenario where we have incredible, unprecedented asset bubbles, and, I, and I'll name them for you again, real estate, equities, and bonds. And when that occurs, It'll take the U.S. economy, and when that bursts, it'll take the U.S. economy down exponentially worse than what occurred in the deflationary collapse of 2008. Yeah, it seems the real economy in the United States is in stuck in worsening stagflation. I mean, I know Silicon Valley is doing well. Wall Street's doing pretty well. Um, I live right outside of Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. and the lobbying crowd is doing very well off, you know, big government growth and um, all these uh, growth of the welfare, welfare warfare state, but it just seems most of the people on Main Street are not doing very well. I, I don't think the real economy is creating that many full-time jobs outside of maybe the shale oil boom, mm -hmm. which has probably kept you know the U.S. from collapsing at this point. Uh, do you, uh, it, it appears that uh, inflationary expectations are starting to increase, and uh, inflation is back after some disinflationary period maybe – from 2011 to 2013. Right, exactly. Well, the Fed, the Fed has these silly models. They believe in the Phillips curve. They're worried about too many people working. They have no idea what causes inflation. So the, the cause of inflation is and always has been a persistent and pervasive fall in the purchasing power of paper money. And that is almost always caused by the market's perception that the currency is going to undergo massive dilution. It is, or it will in the future, undergo massive dilution. And that usually manifests most against trading partners, against in, in currency exchange rates. But we, we don't have that today because every central bank on the planet with their fiat currencies have all went to 0% interest rates, and they've all adopted some form of fiscal uh, and monetary stimulus. So it's hard to get that relationship manifest between currencies, but you do see it manifest in assets. And this particular go around, the, the, the massive amount of liquidity created by the Fed has shown up where in real estate bonds and in equities. And I think that's going to uh, dovetail to and spill over into precious metals. And I think that's going to occur once we, once we all become aware that the Fed's exit from QE will not be seamless and it will be fraught with many, many problems. And that's at that point when this, when this fantasy that, that the Keynesians have developed where you can have strong growth with low inflation in a, in a fiat currency regime is malarkey. You can't have that. 
You see, you can have strong growth without inflation if the strong growth comes from an increase in the labor force and an increase in productivity. But that's not how we do things here in the United States or anywhere, anywhere else on the planet. We get growth now from shoving money down people's throats. Sometimes they spend that money and put it into productive uses to purchase capital goods and grow the economy. And other times it just goes into asset bubbles. And that's exactly what we see today. We don't see the, the, the central bank's excess reserves. They're not going to lend money to, to small businesses to create, to create jobs and to build the economy. It's going to do what? It's going to buy more bonds and more stocks. And what that does, it means that we're going to have inflation, but we're not going to have the growth. So you're, going to get, you're, you're, you're getting further and further into a stagflationary environment. Yeah, and it seems the U.S. has basically backed itself into a stagflationary corner because you're seeing all these announcements about bilateral trade agreements. I mean, I guess one snowflake after another until the avalanche comes, the dollar is slowly lo losing, you know, its world reserve currency status where other countries have decided, you know, we're trading our goods for uh, your goods. Why do we have to settle this trade in dollars? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make a lot of sense, especially when the U.S. is not – producing as much as it used to, and, you know, the U.S. had all the manufacturing capacity after World War II. Right. This is a legacy from Bretton Woods. I mean, I, I, if, you, if you didn't have any gold, you had no manufacturing, and you wanted to tie your currency to the U.S. dollar, which was backed by gold, I could see settling transactions. You know, China between Germany might want to settle a transaction in U.S. dollars, but there isn't, there isn't really any need for a world reserve currency anymore. There's no reason why, uh, why Germany can't buy um, – or Japan can't buy wheat from Germany without involving dollars. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I think people are going to be slowly – and I know this is what's happening. They're slowly going away from the dollar. There's no need to hold trillions of dollars in, in reserves in our bond market. That's slowly eroding, and I think that process uh, uh, becomes more intense as time goes by. Now, um, in terms of asset allocation strategies, Michael, um, the stock market appears to be getting toppy to me. I'm a value investor. Um, you know, the companies, the earnings are just – the earnings are being goosed, I guess, essentially by artificially suppressed interest rates. They're not growing the top line. The revenues are just not there for the large-cap companies. Um, what types of assets do you think are going to do well over the next couple of years going forward? Well, they beat they, – earnings beat expectations. They never talk about earnings in, in reality. What, what, what are the earnings this year compared to what they were – you know, this quarter compared to what they were last year? You'll find if you do year-over-year -year revenue comparisons, there's just no revenue growth really at all because there really isn't much economic growth. We had uh, a, a negative 2.9 percent GDP trend in, in Q1. We're luck, lucky if we get a three-handle in Q2. We'll find out next week. But and that's even that's only after you miscalculate inflation. But you can't get really get revenue growth if you don't get strong nominal GDP growth, and we're just not seeing that. So uh, earnings have been goosed by share buybacks, which has been goosed by uh, corporations vastly increasing the amount of borrowing. In fact, corporations took on well over three trillion dollars in debt since the credit crisis to do what? To buy back their shares. That's this is this way they increase earnings per share. The P.E. ratio, which is at 19, looks less rich, even though that's rich on its own. And all of this is artificially engendered, of course, by taking borrowing costs down to zero. So whatever debt was outstanding in the corporations has been refinanced to a much lower rate, which improves earnings, improves cash flow. Of course, on the private sector, consumers have their debt costs taken way down to, to encourage them to take on more debt, which is exactly what they're doing and to boost this consumption economy. And of course, taking interest rates to 0% boosts real estate and equity prices, which of course boosts consumption, which all of this helps out corporations. So it's all ephemeral, it's all phony, it's ersatz, and it will blow up in their faces, and it will happen soon. Now, um, Michael, you talked about gold and silver. Do you I mean, also? I'm sorry, I didn't answer you. The actual, yeah. Where am I going to be positioned? So right now at Penta Portfolio Strategies, we have 20% allocated to precious metals. We have 20% short the euro, and we have 60, about 60% 60 cash. That's the, that's the rough uh, allocation distribution right now. And why do we have 60% cash? Because I really feel, like you mentioned, the stock market is overvalued. It has decoupled completely from fundamentals. It's in a bubble. 
And I think the end of QE is right around the corner, and that's going to be the reality check that hits this market. Last time QE, QE's ended, let me just go briefly. QE, QE1 ended with a 13% drop in the S&P 500. QE2 ended with a 20%, uh, I'm sorry, a 17% drop in the S&P 500. QE3 is going to end with a north, tw north of 20% drop according to my calculations in the S&P 500. And we'll use that opportunity to buy because I think the Federal Reserve will react to that fall in asset prices with an aggressive monetary stimulus and probably also reducing the interest rate on excess reserves. Yeah, it's, it's just uh, there's been no volatility in the markets for so long. It's been very surprising. I mean, even the yen hasn't moved. It's been – and then the interest rates just getting – keep getting cheaper in Europe for European bonds are even cheaper than the U S this, this just seems like the Truman show This just doesn't, or the twilight zone, you know, pick your analogy. It just, this is just laughable. This not, nothing is, is, is any, has anything to do with reality anymore. No, you're, you're right about that. hundred percent. Correct. Um, well, this is what happens when you, when you, uh, issue markets for the sake of central bankers and politicians. So, there, for instance, the, uh, the, the Bank of Japan has so dominated the JGB market, Japanese government bond market, there are times where the, the bonds don't even trade for a few days. There's nobody wants to buy a bond when they're getting it at half a percentage point return over 10 years when inflation is already running close to 2% and, and destined to go much higher. And nobody wants to sell the bond because – they know that the Bank of Japan is going to buy them all and won't allow the prices to go down. So, uh, I mean, you just shut out the, you just crowded out all private markets. You're crowding out in, in individual investors in U.S. markets. There's no volatility anymore. Everything has been, like you said, the Truman Show. It's all prearranged and predestined. And if you think you have any faith in the government uh, engineering, a perfect escape plan from all of what they've done, then you're in, a, in for a very, very big surprise. And I don't mean you. I mean investors. Most people believe in this Keynesian fantasy world that the Federal Reserve can, can extricate itself from six years of ZERP and a $4.5 trillion balance sheet without any problems at all. And I, and I, I, I can tell you that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen here or in China or Japan. Or in Europe, these all of these sovereign nations have vastly increased increased the amount of debt outstanding, and they've done this in the context of the hope of creating ever increasing inflation, and they've done that in the context of perpetually reduced borrowing costs. That just cannot be uh, tenable in reality. So it's going to end and end badly. Very good. And yeah, it, exactly. Suppressing the interest rates, suppressing the price of money, it, it has so many ramifications and reverberations throughout e everything that the Keynesians can't fully quantify any of these things with their bad models. Mm, exactly right. And all their models are wrong. <laughs> Well, um, in wrapping up this interview, Michael, uh, please tell our listeners more about Pento Portfolio Strategies if they're interested in uh, giving you their money. Well, you can email me at mpento at pentaport.com. The website is www.pentaport.com. I've created a very unique strategy on, on uh, Wall Street. I model the growth rate in the money supply, and that way I model the difference between inflation and deflation. So, for instance, you want to own gold. To protect yourself, but when do you want to own it? You want to own silver, you want to own precious metals in general, but I don't just do that and then just forget about it. So you want to own precious metals from 2001 to 2012, but it's not such a good idea to own them from 2012 to 2014 when they dropped by you know, 70 percent. But from 2001 to 2012, they were up by 900 percent precious metal equities. So if you can model that correctly, you have a much better return. If you agree with me that we're, we're in such bad shape and this isn't going to end badly, you might as well get with an advisor that understands that it's great to own hedges against this catastrophe, catastrophe but don't always hold them. Know when to sell, know when to buy. Okay. Well, thank you again for your time, Michael, and uh, we'll try to have you back on again. Thank soon. you, Jason. Bye-bye.